Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me for part two of our discussion on building high quality Visual Studio extensions is Omer Raviv. Hey there. Of Code Value, uh, authors of the Oz Code extension. And in part one of this discussion, we talked about building more testable and more stable extensions. And in this part, we're going to talk about more performant, more memory efficient. So again, continuing our discussion on best practices for building extensions. But so far, a lot of what you've been talking about is just good practices for building high quality code in the first place. Absolutely. Whether or not you're building an extension. Absolutely. That in Visual Studio extensions, the bar is set a lot higher. Right. And particularly about what we're talking going to be talking about today, performance and memory efficiency. Um, there's different constraints in Visual Studio extensions. Like Visual Studio is a 32-bit process, mm -hmm. and we're sharing that process with a lot of other people. We're sharing it with Rosin. We're sharing it with uh, other Visual Studio extensions. Everybody goes to that .NET garbage collector and says, give me, give me, give me. I need some more. Yeah. And that garbage collector, if you don't treat it nicely, it will eventually just you know create a very bad experience for the end user where you slow down, you freeze. Mm -hmm. And that's the worst thing uh, Visual, Studio, Visual Studio Extension can, uh, has to deal with, right? Is that you uh, do all this work, you create a really great Visual Studio Extension, and eventually it, people have such a low bar nowadays for things being slow because they're used to their phone just going like this, that if your Visual Studio Extension lags just a tiny bit, their, the user's uh, itchy tring, uh, trigger finger on mm -hmm. that uninstall button is really fast. Yep. Um, so today, we're going to talk about making our extensions performant and memory efficient. Okay. And um, we, you notice that in Visual Studio 2017, if your extension slows down uh, particular things, like the initialization of Visual Studio, or uh, when user types in stuff into the editor and you get the buffer changed event, or a tool window opens up. If you are too slow in doing any of those things, uh, Visual Studio will actually tell you that uh, your uh, tell the user that the extension is running too slow, right. and you don't want that. So, two ways to deal with that. First of all, you want to delay your extension load as much as possible. So for example, Oscode is a good example of this. Oscode is ex only helpful, helpful when you have a C-sharp project in your solution, and it's only helpful when you're debugging. Mm -hmm. So up until that point where you actually started a debugging a C-sharp project, we won't load. The way we, you do that is you use the UI context rules, which are, rule, which are attributes just like these ones right here, which, which can we apply on the Visual Studio package to tell it what's what. The second thing you want to do is you want to load your package in the background using the async package pattern. What that means is that the initializer of our uh, Visual Studio extension, instead of initialize, we have initialize async. We derive from the async package. And we have an async uh, uh, code here that basically returns a task that's completed once our Visual Studio extension is up and running. So how do you manage? So delay loading your extension says that when I Fire up Visual Studio, you haven't loaded yet because I may or may not be using you. Yeah. That's and probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I need you, mm -hmm. you're not loaded yet. So all the delay in loading occurs right when I need you most. Well, How do you manage that? How do you well, balance that? Well, if, if you just started debugging right now, your mm -hmm. finger went for that F5 button, yeah. it'll probably take you more than a few seconds until you actually use the, the, the features of the product, right? Okay. So a UI context rule could be very fine-grained. It could be when the solution is loaded initially. It could be when you start debugging, is when a, a specific project has been loaded, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Visual Studio can, and you have very fine-grained control. You can do very complicated UI context rules to know exactly when you want to load. And you, uh, you want to aim for you know, just before the user might want to start uh, okay. using it, right? Okay. And and uh, the initialize pack uh, method of your of your package is something that should no, uh, take no longer than just very few moments. But okay. even if it's just one second or two, if it's running on the UI thread and you're not using the async uh, package pattern, um, Visual Studio will tell the user that you're you're slowing them down. And Got the uh, most unfortunate thing is that that might not even be your fault necessarily, because if you're you're using the old pattern of initial and you're 
uh, asking Visual Studio for different MEF components that you need in order to initialize your package because of things like UI thread reentrancy and just the um, you might trigger all of the MEF tree of components loading at that particular moment just because the order in which uh, packages are loaded into Visual Studio is not deterministic and you might just end up being the first one. So okay. when you ask for dependencies, Visual Studio has to say, oh, you want that? Okay, I'm going to do that. Hold on. Um, and, and that will all add up into uh, the user ending up seeing uh, that message about okay. your extension. OK, so that was uh, uh, dealing with uh, loading our extensions. The other thing is that how do we make sure that just the way the, the extension operates is fast enough? And for that, we have another open source library that the Oscode team has published, which is called Visual Studio Exploration Tests. Now, this is a really good way to make sure that your test is, your Visual Studio extension is performing well. Um, basically, I think there are two sources of uncertainty when you're talking about writing a Visual Studio extension. One source of uncertainty is what other Visual Studio extensions are installed. Right. Uh, that might cause performance issues, and it will also very likely cause, might cause crashes uh, that you didn't expect because you as personally are not using the same other extensions than your users are. And when you get crashes, you'd want to look up the chapter we did before to, with some advice on how to do that, to deal with that. The other source of uncertainty and fear and doubt uh, uh, in a Visual Studio extension is that you never know what the code that people who are, go who are going to be using your Visual Studio extension actually looks like, right? Mm -hmm. People have a lot of really crazy code that's doing a lot of really weird and interesting stuff with a lot of very weird and interesting platforms. And you could not possibly, no matter how much emphasis you put on testing, you could not possibly create all those infinite amount of possibilities uh, into your test uh, to ma and make sure, and, in, and into your performance tests to make sure that your extension performs adequately adequately yep. in all possible scenarios. So luckily, there's actually a website on the internet. You might have heard about it. It's called GitHub. And it has a lot of C-sharp code that. in it. Mm -hmm. And what we've done with the open source library we've released, the Visual Studio Exploration Test, which I will show you right now, is we've released a library that a actually knows how to uh, download open source C-sharp projects off of GitHub and then run some tests on them and make sure that their performance or actually make sure whatever it is you want to do with them. Wait, say again? example, let's go to uh, applicate. We have uh, apps repository. Um, right here, I'm just uh, take creating this uh, with some code. You can also actually create a JSON file and just serialize it, which might be a bit more convenient. So this is an example of an open source project that's on GitHub. It's ILSpy, which is a really neat uh, WPF-based ILD compiler, just mm -hmm. Relic Reflector. So we're giving uh, the Visual Studio Integration Tests framework the clone URL for that GitHub repository. We're giving it a specific commit hash, because we probably want the, same, the test to run against the same exact version of the source code each time we run it. And we give it the path for the particular SLN file. So this is bringing down code that I'm going to test. Your extension my on. My extension with. Because what this is doing is this is giving me a broad range of other people's code, mm -hmm. uh, code that people might be running. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it gives me a way of testing the extension in a variety of environments, the environments being projects that people might actually be using in real life. Absolutely. Got it. OK. Perfect. Um, now. And you chose these because they have a breadth of things that people are doing. Yeah, I mean, right now in this example, I just show you ILSpy, but we, what we do in the OzCode team, we try to take up the, the biggest variety that we have. Okay. So we have WPF apps, and WinForms apps, and console apps, and .NET Core, and NetCenter mm -hmm. 2, and, and all these different uh, types of technologies so that we cover the, uh, as many scenarios as we possibly can. All right, cool. Um, OK, and what you would want to do with this, so there's several things you could do. You could do, the first thing is performance testing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show you a sample of how we do performance testing in OzCode. So OzCode being a Visual Studio extension that has to do with debugging, one of the things we're most concerned of is F10 performance. We want to make sure that when you hit F10, we don't lag or slow you down in any way. And we're even more crazy about that, that, uh, about that than you'd think, because if you hit F10 really fast, then OzCode needs to know this is a fast 
step. So we're going to cancel whatever and just let you get on with your life. And if you're fa stepping through slower, then uh, we need to make sure that you know, we do get all those visualizations up, but we don't create any slowdown or, or make you feel like your UI thread is stalling. So what we have here is we're again using the host type uh, attribute. And if you don't know what it is, you probably want to check out the previous video in this series. Which, but basically what it means is that when we run this test, it loads up an instance of Visual Studio mm -hmm. and there's test run within that, ta that, uh, uh, that particular instance. And this test property is which Visual Studio Hive this is going to use. So you can actually have your uh, Visual Studio Hive is basically a, a sort of like a copy of Visual Studio. So this is one of the first things you learn as a Visual Studio extension offer, is that when you hit F5, the mm -hmm. very first time you build a Visual Studio extension, that extension isn't loaded into the same Visual Studio that you're using to right. build it, because that would be a really... It's a test uh, instance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's called the Visual Studio Experimental Instance. Experimental. Exactly. And it's sort of like a, a shallow copy of your Visual Studio. It has its own configurations. It has its own extensions that are installed mm -hmm. on it and so on and so forth. Now, what we're doing here is we're going to, we, we want to test that, run this performance test in different environments. So first off, just to see, get a baseline, we're running it on a hive that has no OS code installed because we want to know what we're comparing ourselves against, right? Okay. Some sort of baseline. Um, and we can also uh, have, a, so uh, this is a test that actually tests OS code. So it, it's run on a Visual Studio Hive that has OS code installed on it. Do you define that Hive ahead of time? Um, so yeah, so you can uh, basically when we, were, oh, okay, how do we start up a Hive? If I do devenv slash root suffix, um, no uh, OS code, it will, create a new Visual Studio. If I right. create a new Visual Studio, uh, if I call this, I can give it whatever name I want, basically. Okay. Uh, I can call it OzCode installed. I can call it OzCode read resharper or some other extension that I want to make sure I'm performing well with. Uh, and I just inst a new instance of Visual Studio comes up. I load whatever extensions I want okay. on it or, or whatever okay. configurations. So you do that part manually. Yes. Got it. Um, though you can automate that as well, and we'll, uh, we might contribute some, some more things to show you how okay. to do that as well. Um, but now I'm, I'm saying run test, and I've got these different test aspects on it. So what's a test aspect? Test aspect is basically just something that you can implement to do whatever it is you want to do. So your test doesn't necessarily have to do with debugging. You can use the debugger or not. Uh, you can do something when the test started, when the test finished, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can have a test that steps over code, but this is an OS code thing. You can just ignore that. Um, and what you can do, so for OS code, what we do is we just say uh, step over, we step over a bunch of code. And another aspect that we have is the dot trace aspect. So what we do, so this is a, in, in our instance is a performance test. So we have an aspect that we wrote that's not part of the open source uh, uh, general solution, which just takes down how much time it took to step over each line of code and make sure it's not uh, above, uh, above the baseline, right? Mm -hmm. Above how much. Uh, it would take to step over that line of code if you don't have OS code installed. If we do have find out that we have a performance problem, we have another aspect here, which is the dot trace aspect. So I'm personally using the dot trace dot net performance profiler, but you could use this with any other uh, performance profiler. And we're actually uh, accepting pull requests and profilers as well. Um, but the idea is that you uh, can run your uh, uh, performance test with a .NET profiler installed. So that if your build server is running your, your performance test and figures out, hey, there's a regression, something's going too slow, uh, uh, um, you can actually have that um, profiler snapshot as an artifact from the build server. That's what we do uh, on our team. Okay. Um, and you can actually immediately look into the, the performance profiler and see whether the problem is. Um, so that's that's what how we roll. We whenever somebody commits a new chicken into the OS code repository, we have a, a, a VM on Azure that loads up, runs all of our uh, performance tests, and if something's going too slow, we just immediately get a profiler snapshot. We can see exactly where the problem was. Okay. The other thing um, you should do, uh, you could do, and then we do with this idea of Visual Studio exploration tests, tests that uh, grab open source code off of GitHub and test against it, is just Roslyn-based stuff. Like, for example, in OS code, we have a lot of 
Roslyn refactorings and, and uh, or not code fixes, stuff that manipulates code with right. Roslyn. For example, we have the new link debugging functionality in Oz code, which needs to take a link query and does basically open brain surgery, a bunch of syntax rewriting on it, so that we can give you a really good visualizations on top of that link query. But we couldn't possibly foresee all the different crazy ways people could possibly write link queries. Mm -hmm. um, so what you could do is you could actually do a, 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 a test for all those uh, all your rewriters against all the different source code that you have. Because one of the nice properties about a refactoring, if you're doing a refactoring with Rosling or a code fix, you probably the basic requirements is that the code should compile both before and after you apply your your, right. your refactoring, and that's pretty hard to get right when you look at all. Uh, it's really hard to consider all the different edge cases in all of people's code. So another thing that we do with this framework is we basically take all of our Roslyn refactorings and code fixes. We apply them wherever they can possibly be applicable in the open source code that we download off of GitHub. And we ru run it on each and every single one and make sure that the code still compiles after applying those code fixes. OK. Cool. So. We've talked about making extensions performant, but now let's talk about the real nitty gritty, which is how do we make our extensions memory efficient? That's right. extremely, extremely important. Again, we have a lot of different extensions on that same garbage collector, all having a good time, but all creating a lot of work for that garbage collector. So my first and probably most important tip about uh, dealing with memory in uh, Visual Studio extensions is that you want to create. Uh, you want to keep your diagnostics tool window open. So whenever so I so I'll add a uh, beginner tip to that is understand what's in there. Absolutely. So <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> that, that I remember the first time I saw that window, it came up and said, "Oh my gosh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. It's in my way. Close it." You know, whenever <laughs> I do a conference talk <laughs> about the Visual Studio Debugger, uh -huh. I've been going around the world. I just came back from Germany where I talked a lot about. Uh, the Visual Studio Debugger, I start by saying, have you guys seen this window, this diagnostics tool window, the first time you started the debugging in Visual Studio 2015? So everybody in the room right. says yes. How many of you understand what's in it? Era, uh, crickets. Uh, crickets. Yeah. Uh, how many of you kept it open after the first time you saw it? And have you ever seen it again since? Nobody in the room yeah. responds. And that's to, you know, really Which is painful for the product team to hear, but that is reality. And it's such it's painful for me to hear also because in my opinion, this is one of the best things that has been added into Visual Studio. It's extremely, extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. You just need to know uh, what the power it gives you. Right. And as a Visual Studio extension offer, this is a must have. You right. cannot uh, or you should definitely not r attempt to write a Visual Studio extension if you're not aware of the two most important patterns in, uh, in, in memory problems, which are memory leak and GC pressure. So this is a picture of the process. Let's zoom in on the process memory part of the .NET, of the, uh, .NET Diagnostics Tools window. So there are two major problems that we might have in a Visual Studio extension, and it's really easy to accidentally uh, put yourself in a situation where you're, you're, you're having these issues. One is a memory leak. So a memory leak is pretty simple to understand. The, process use, the memory usage of our process goes up and up and up and up. And we get occasional GC. So the, the yellow here is GC time. So the GC uh, occasionally has to come into the picture progressively more and more as the memory usage goes up. Mm -hmm. And it tries to solve the problem, but it can't because we are keeping hold of references to objects that we don't need anymore. The other equally important problem in uh, working with Visual Studio extensions is we often create GC pressure, way, way too much GC pressure. What GC pressure means is that the memory usage of our application is more or less the same, right? We don't have a memory leak. We are letting go of those objects, but we're just doing too much work. We're right. creating too many allocations. Our code is too allocate -y. I really love using that word. Like uh, in a code review, I'd sometimes say, that code's a bit too allocate -y for my taste. It just creates too many objects. And we're, if we're running inside of a tight loop, uh, we can't afford to uh, keep the GC uh, so busy. A good uh, ballpark number uh, is that uh, if you look at an execution of a .NET application, if the amount percentage of the, am of the amount of time spent in GC is more than 10%, you should say 
hold on a minute, something's fishy. I need to go and look at and this. Where do you where do you see that? So you don't actually see that inside yeah. of the uh, the actual number, but you actually you can just train your eyes that when you see this this pattern, you see the the yellow, mm -hmm. uh, too much yellow. That means that there's a problem. Yeah. You can actually look up that number inside of the uh, Perfmon tool okay. that comes with Windows if you want. Um, okay, so dealing with GC pressure. Um, so let's talk about both issues separately. Mem how do we deal with memory leaks? How do we deal with GC pressure inside of our Visual Studio extensions? Um, and and let's start with GC pressure because GC pressure is the one we're most prone to to go to, uh, to cause in Visual Studio extensions because we're dealing with syntax trees, we're dealing with code. There's usually a tons of strings that represent method names and namespaces mm -hmm. and classes and all that stuff. So first tip: always be measuring. How much are we allocating? What is that? A percentage of the amount of time spent in GC. Open up Perfmon, look at it. Modern uh, .NET memory tools will tell you if you have a problem where you're keeping many instances of the same string in memory, so you can uh, use a string intern pool. So a string intern pool is a really good. Uh, uh, oops. A string intern pool is basically the idea that if we have many instances of the same string, we can just strings are immutable in the net. We don't mm -hmm. need a million copies of the word system or MS Coralib inside of our uh, uh, .NET application on our, or our Visual Studio. The other thing you could do is you could use the Visual Studio extension that will actually highlight in the code code that is too allocate-y. Like mm -hmm. there's different patterns of using uh, C Sharp that will cause all these subtle allocations that you might not realize. Like, for example, whenever we use a lambda expression and we capture a variable, uh, which is a local variable, it actually has to capture that variable. And under the scenes, the C Sharp compiler is creating something that allocates uh, uh, an instance of a class. So uh, if you install the Roslyn heap allocation analyzers, it basically puts a little green marker wherever there's an allocation in your code. And you can mm -hmm. actually uh, get a better feel for is your code too allocated uh, or not. Well, that, co that code is bad? That code isn't bad, per se. It's not but efficient. It's, it's not. It's allocated, right? Because you're using the word inside uh, this, yeah. the variable word inside of this lambda expression. And that means that every single time we enter this for each loop, we're, we're creating, we're allocating something on the garbage collector heap. Mm -hmm. We are creating memory pressure. So if this is a regular piece of code that just runs every 20 minutes for one second, then probably not nothing to worry about. But if it's, this is a tight loop, which is going over all of the code in the user's uh, solution, for example, you want to be aware of these things. OK. okay. So, so before yeah. we move on, what's the potential fix for that? So potential fix for that is just uh, don't use a lambda expression here. You don't okay. need to. Right. Uh, that's the easiest one. Um, OK. So let's talk about memory leaks. The problem with memory leaks is they're a lot like high blood pressure. They sort of sneak up on you. They build up. They build up. And eventually, they just kill you. Um, and, and, but you don't notice that it, it's a problem until it's, it's really too late, in a sense, because um, you know, you're usually writing your Visual Studio extension, and you're, you know, you're opening Visual Studio and closing Visual Studio 20 times a day as mm -hmm. a Visual Studio extension offer. But your users are not. Your users probably have the same instance of Visual Studio day in, day out. They probably leave it open when they go home. They come back the next day. They keep working on it. Um, hoping that you that we haven't crashed it, mm -hmm. uh, leading back again to the first chapter of our, our, of our series here. Um, and so it's extremely important that we have tests for memory leaks, uh, right? Because memory leaks can creep in in very subtle ways without us even realizing. And we can introduce them very, very easily, uh, you know, uh, with, and it's really hard to detect. So the best way to detect it is by just having our continuous integration pipeline tell us when we have had introduced a new memory leak. There's two different ways we can do that. The first one, and a great example for this, is up on the VSVim uh, GitHub repository. Again, uh, VSVim is one of the best uh, resources you have at your disposal as a Visual Studio extension offer. It has an example for how to do pretty much everything you'd want to do in a Visual Studio exa example. It's a great reference. Um, and one of the things they do there is testing uh, using unit tests for a memory leak. What do we do here? We just create a new instance of an object with a reek reference to it, to an object that we want to make sure is not leaky. 
Mm -hmm. um, we run whatever test we have. We run the garbage collector, and just we make sure that um, that object isn't needed anymore once we've finished whatever it is we're doing. So that, I'd call that the poor man's approach. It's not really the poor man's approach. It's the the version that doesn't cost any money. There's another option that usually does cost money, because uh, this is usually uh, uh, an API that uh, uh, the, your .NET performance profiler will give you. So if you're using Redgate Ants profiler or JetBrains.trace, or if you're using the Visual Studio profiler, most of these profilers all actually also come with an SDK. And what that SDK will let you do, it will let you um, uh, start a profiling session from within your code. You just mm -hmm. So uh, you can start the test. Um, and this is especially useful when you're combining it with the, the Oz code Visual Studio integration test library that we sh we've seen in the previous episode, where what we do is we create a test that goes through an entire user journey of using some feature. And then we go back to some idle state. So every Visual Studio extension has an idle state. So that might mean that Visual Studio is open, but all of the text editors are closed. Or for Oz code, an idle state means that, because we're a debugging extension, mm -hmm. an idle state means that the user stopped the debugger. And that, at that point, we know that Oz code shouldn't have any access objects still, still in memory. Uh, and then you can do a memory assertion. So a memory assertion can be something like, make sure there are, there are currently no instances of a given type in memory anywhere, or there are no more than five, or there are mo no more than uh, uh, no more instances since the last snapshot that I took. Okay. And these are this basically bakes in uh, protection against memory leaks into your testing infrastructure. And another very cool thing you get out of that is that if we, we did accidentally introduce a memory leak, you can have your uh, continuous integration server create a snapshot as an artifact of that test. So you, that's a great user experience. Your team will thank you for it. And your team will also be appreciative of how important it is to have tests around if they see that every single time they introduce a new memory leak, they get a notification from the build server that the build failed, and they just click on a file that opens up the, the, the memory snapshot in a memory profiler, mm -hmm. and they see exactly how and where they introduced a memory leak into the system, okay. into the extension. That's it. We're, We're finished. finished. <laughs> the last thing I want to tell you is to just to sum up here is that we talked about a lot of different patterns. Somehow everything led back to the concept of testability and having good a good true continuous pipeline continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline for mm -hmm. your Visual Studio extension. I want to finish off with this quote from Martin Fowler, which I absolutely love which is he defines this idea of continuous delivery as something where a business sponsor could request that the current development version of the software be deployed to production at a moment's notice, and nobody would bat an eyelid, let alone panic, I'd say let alone burn the building. Right. Um, and that's something like we're not quite there yet. Like I don't just deploy a new version of Oz code without thinking about it uh, willy-nilly. But I do feel that I have a lot of trust nowadays that if I do that, that, the cur that our tests, our performance tests, our memory leak tests give me that assurance that the software is working correctly, is performant, is stable, is memory efficient, and all that. So as an extension builder, you would be OK getting to a point where you're uh, delivering and updating on a fairly regular cadence. Like Visual Studio, what are we on, three-week sprints or something? Mm -hmm. It seems like every three weeks there's a new version. There's 15.3, you know, then there's 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. Yeah. I don't know what we're up to now. I think we're up to 3.5 as yeah. we're filming this. Pretty soon there'll be a 4. Right. Um, so every few weeks, which I think is a great thing because what's being delivered is either new features or bug fixes, both of which I'm kind of happy with. Absolutely. So and as an extension developer, are you kind of moving towards that same cadence? Abs absolutely. And as an extension offer, you actually get a really great thing for free. So uh, if you're deploying your extension as a VSX file, not as an MSI, mm -hmm. um, Visual Studio now actually works kind of like uh, Google Chrome or like apps do on your iPhone or, or Android phone in that they update themselves without you even noticing. Mm. So you, most people aren't even aware of this. But if you're, you're using a VSX deployment uh, extension, which most extensions are deployed as VSX files, mm -hmm. um, if you close down Visual Studio and then come back tomorrow, open it again, you might actually have a newer version of the Visual Studio extension installed because Visual Studio took care of that for you oh, behind cool. the scenes. Okay. So absolutely. 
Cool. Cool. cool All cool. right. So, two episodes on writing high quality extensions. Lots of great tips and tricks, not only for extension builders, but for even for folks that aren't. Absolutely. So, hope you got a lot of, lot out of that. Enjoyed it, and we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.